All right, now I didn't have like massive expectations for an outstanding run. I wasn't expecting this to be some kick-ass go-home show before their WrestleMania of the summer. But I was expecting better. I mean, now, now to be fair, I feel like in some ways the WWE tried to not make this week's show suck. I think they tried in a sense that they tried in a way that they think they tried. But the effort came across really pathetic, and I thought the execution was very poor and most certainly doesn't have my hopes high for SummerSlam this Sunday, especially the fact that it's a four-freaking-hour show, ladies and gentlemen. Four hours! You know, like, I think about it, and I say this, is that once the previous week's Raw ends, you've got almost seven full days to sit there and get the show ready. And I would think at least if anything else, from a, a somewhat logical perspective, that if there was any one segment that just by default would never suck, or that one segment that would be really, really good because you would have the most emphasis on it because it's the one that sets the table for the entire night, it would be the opening segment. You would think that that's the one segment that 100% for sure you can map out, you can plan out, you don't have to adjust anything within the show, you don't have to change anything, you don't have to tweak anything, you don't have to do anything in terms of time. You have all the flexibility in the world to do whatever the hell you want with that opening segment. It goes as long as you want it to go, you can do what you want to do within your boundaries and confines. You would think you'd find a way to at least, if anything else, Get the show off to a raging, roaring start, especially knowing that traditionally with Raw being a three-hour show in this format, that the first hour rating severely lagged behind the second hour and the third hour. I mean, that's, that's been a continual trend, so you would think that this company would do a better job of trying to really ramp up the first hour. And it all starts with that opening segment. And I'm sorry, when you've got this butt-fumble type of infomercial opening segment, I mean... How lame is this shit? It's basically Triple H and Stephanie doing a mini infomercial for the pay-per-view on Sunday. Now, on the one hand, you'll sit there and say, well, they were touching on what was going to happen. They were trying to hype it up. I get that. But again, this was a fucking glorified infomercial. A glorified infomercial. This is, even though you have three hours of it, Every Monday night, granted, still very precious, very precious indeed, television time. Prime time cable television time. And you're devoting the first several minutes of it to run a glorified TV commercial with two of your most recognizable faces on your brand. Who in the bluest of blue fucks thought this was a good utilization of talent and time? Who in the bluest of blue thought fucks thought in any way, shape, or form that this was anything close to a tangibly good fucking idea. I mean, this was so bad. And to tell you how bad it was, I don't know if this was done and the production team sabotaging them in the truck or just everything was all fucked up because it really set the tone for the rest of the night. When you've got Triple H and Stephanie pumping up Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker, about halfway through, you see the graphic for John Cena versus Seth Rollins, champion versus champion, Title versus title, winner take all, meaning probably nobody takes any damn thing. And they're still talking about The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar. It was one of the first of several off-the-mark misses that I saw on this week's show. Just bad. And it all starts right there with that opening segment. If you can't, after a week of having to prepare for it, give us a better opening segment, how the hell can you expect us to tune into the rest of the three hours? How in the hell can we, in any way, shape, or form, expect the rest of that three hours to be anywhere close to remotely good? And again, this Raw is so much like all of the Raws are now. The formatting is pathetic and is predictability. Lots of random waste of time matches. Now, look, I understand people get excited about a tag match. You know, oh, he's going to get some wrestling. We need wrestling on a wrestling show. Fuck you, Slag Daddy. But shit, you got Cesaro botching on the freaking match. 
And I don't know what the hell happened with that rope spot. And then you've got Owens and Randy Orton. It looks like they botched a damn near spot too. And Owens had to kind of push Orton out there so that way he could RKO Sheamus. It was just, it was, it was so fitting to so many things about the WWE product. And again, it was just a series of botches throughout the freaking night. Like they did this little pre-recorded thing with The Undertaker talking and it's just... It, it, it felt like a Taker promo from like 10 years ago on SmackDown, but nowhere near as good. It was like they couldn't really come up with anything creative for him to say, so as a result, let's just regurgitate Taker talking points from the past two plus fucking decades. Then you've got the Divas Revolution crap, which again is lame as fuck because they do the same shit with them. All of this grab ass and we're doing all this circle jerk and we're doing, we are accomplishing absolutely fucking nothing. The only thing that has happened with this alleged revolution is that the Divas get one extra match. And that's not exactly change we can be proud of. That's change we could go, <laughs> seriously. And then who's the jackass that decided to put a uh, freaking Sasha versus the Bella slut right before the end of the night in the Brock Lesnar homecoming segment. Who the fuck did that? You were intentionally sabotaging these divas. It wouldn't be... It would be even more sad if it wasn't so fucking tragic. And the fact is you probably think that Vince wanted to intentionally put it there because Vince doesn't know why the fuck he wanted to put it there. He just wanted to put it there. Look, if you want to piss off the fans... In the segment before, so that way they really pop for the Brock Lesnar homecoming segment. Then have Bo Dallas come out and do something stupid. Have The Miz come out and do something stupid. And instead, you trot out a Divas match. Where, my God, I don't even know what the hell. That kick that was supposed to go to Sasha Banks missed by two fucking feet. That was terrible. Terrible. There was more botching throughout the fucking night. Another one is when the whole shit's going down with Lana and Rusev in the ring after she sits there and pops Summer. She's calling Rusev in, and then she's looking, and then she's looking, and I'm like, somebody missed their fucking cue in the production truck, or her timing is incredibly off. So after like the third or fourth time of an awkward stare and a smile, it's like, no, mm, yes, here comes the 195-pound somewhat cut beefcake of Dolph Ziggler to come see you all fucking day. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you spent all of this time building up to this, getting Dolph Ziggler's big return, and we're not even getting a freaking t mixed tag match at SummerSlam. It's like, what the fuck is the point of all this? <laughs> What's the point of all this? Yeah, that's a really good question at this point in time. Seriously, what in the fuck is the point of all of this? And then... Of course, it just wouldn't be a lame raw if we didn't have John Cena involved and whoopty skipped and hoopty doo. Here we go, another lame ass contract signing segment. So it was fine when you had Seth Rollins saying what Seth Rollins was saying. It's like he's aggressive, he's not afraid, he's the man. He's finally acting like John Cena is the one that has something to prove because Seth Rollins is a WWE World Heavyweight Champion. It's like, this is what I'm waiting for. So, finally, they've done something good with Seth Rollins, giving him a little bit of something to sink his mother humping teeth into Davenport, Iowa style. And then, of course, John Cena comes out and it, fuck it all. He just sits there and Seth Rollins looks like a punk bitch. And then John Cena says the same old shit he said for a decade, like a punk bitch. However, what was funny is the entire time, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that caught this, a lot of what Seth Rollins said about John Cena sounds exactly like what the fuck I would say about John Cena in a promo. It sounds like a lot of the shit I said about John Cena in a lot of videos. Oh, Colby, have you been watching the Schlag Daddy? And WWE Creative Team, if you're watching my shit and you're ripping me off, where's my royalty check, brother? Oh my god. What a lame-ass fucking contract signing. Just so, again, Cena can shine. Just so, again, Cena can have the fucking spotlight. Just unfucking necessary and so lame. It's a contract signing where you don't even come to fucking blows. It's John Cena says his piece. 
trying to be like The Rock, of course, not having nearly the charisma, the ability to deliver a comedic line, lacking the timing, and so many other fucking things of The Rock, and then he storms off like he's got a broomstick up his ass, and Seth, Seth Rollins stands there looking like a fucking punk bitch. Punk bitch. Imagine that. Oh, my Christ. And then we get to the main event. you got Brock Lesnar's homecoming. And the Minnesota people are happy that the guy who hardly ever leaves Minnesota is back in Minnesota once again. But seriously, it was good. It was really good the way it started off and the way it came across on television. Heyman said some things, but Heyman didn't say too much. It was, a, it was like a lady's skirt should be. It was long enough to cover the subject, short enough to keep it interesting, and that's how I like it. And this was good. And then, you know, throughout the thing, you've got Taker's gong hitting and the lights going out, so we're playing mind games. And then eventually Taker does come out, and he ends up nut shotting Brock Lesnar again. I kind of personally like the don't gives no fucks Taker, but I don't like the way this show ended. To me, Brock Lesnar is the top babyface of the company by a mile. I don't even think it's fucking close, and I really don't think anybody disputes that. He's been the top babyface in the company since he annihilated Cena at SummerSlam. As I accurately said he was, it just took some other people a few months to finally fucking figure this fact out. But he's been the top babyface of your company for a year now. A year now. And all the while, you have perhaps the most respected figure in the history of the business and most especially in the history of the WWE coming back and nutshotting him and laying him out in this homecoming. And it's confusing to figure out what the fuck exactly is going on here. It's like you're trying to tease Taker as a heel, but there's really no point in Taker being heel. You don't have enough time to turn him and develop him as a heel, and nobody wants to fucking boo Taker. And then on the flip side... You most certainly aren't going to be able to take Lesnar and turn him heel at this point because the people don't want to boo Lesnar. They want to cheer Lesnar. And they, at this point, what the hell else do they have to fucking cheer for? It's gotten so bad that the top baby face in the company is the guy that shows up a couple of times a year, does a bunch of suplex city bitches, and that's the extent of the storytelling of this fucking match. I mean, seriously. And you've got Brock Lesnar, this mammoth man, this monstrosity beast. You know, legit amateur wrestler, NCAA heavyweight champion, UFC former world champion, multiple-time WWE world champion, and now the guy who's almost 50, who lost to him at WrestleMania 30 and was dominated, the guy who could barely beat Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania 31, is now leaving him, leaving him laying in the ring once again. If anything, for this homecoming segment, if anybody was going to stand tall, it should have been Brock fucking Lesnar. I don't know who booked this finish. I understand that because Lesnar is Lesnar, you feel he's more established and you're trying to establish Taker, you're trying to build him up. I get that, but I don't understand the logic of why you would actually want to do that, and I don't understand who made this decision and why they made this decision, because I thought the decision was absolutely the shits. Why are you making Brock Lesnar look like that? When he's sitting there and wiping out multiple people other times, like the whole entire authority, but now a guy who's almost 50 who hardly ever wrestles anymore comes out nut shots, I and mean, now it's all it takes apparently to knock Brock Lesnar down. And my bigger concern about this is the way that they built this up as to be a grudge match and being too big for WrestleMania, the tagline should also be too big for SummerSlam. This is the type of match, this is the type of fight that should have that type of personal feeling to it to the point where it should be unsanctioned or it should be a steel cage match or it should be a street fight or it should be a fucking hell in a cell. And to the best of my knowledge, and granted I haven't looked the past day or two because I really don't give a fuck, but the best of my knowledge, this is just a standard wrestling match. And while it's great that Taker's going to be wrestling at SummerSlam in the main event, that's all fine and good. It's a lot easier for him to have a really good match if there's a special stipulation there. And in particular, when you look at how you've been building this up, frankly, in the way that you should have built up to their match at WrestleMania 30, this is the buildup you should have had for the first time, maybe minus the nutshell, but fuck it, maybe not. 
Instead, now we're getting it, and you're building it into a real personal issue, and it's going to be just like every other fucking match on the card. There's nothing special about the stipulation on it. There's no type of other things other than the fact that it's too big for WrestleMania. So we're going to put it on the bastardized version of WrestleMania that comes in the summer in the Barclays Center that holds a fourth or fifth of the people that WrestleMania would. And we're going to make the show the same like the time. <laughs> it would just... I guess I, I feel like the WWE tried. I do. It's just... It's hard to get me excited about a four-hour show that's going to be pretty much nothing but wrestling. When every week I tune into Raw and it's basically nothing but wrestling. When you have very few promo segments or talk segments on a show and they typically are not good, that doesn't really help. And that most certainly doesn't advance characters, that doesn't advance issues, that doesn't advance stories, that doesn't advance interest in the matches at the special events, the pay-per-views. And that's the whole problem here. I mean, I should be at least somewhat excited about SummerSlam come Sunday, but I'm focused on the fact that it's fucking four hours. I'm focused on the fact that Cena might become, even though I don't know it's likely, there's always that chance because it involves John Felix Anthony Cena that he could be the fucking 16-time world champion by the end of the night. Or, by God, Sheamus could be the fucking, oh my God, I don't even want to say it. You know, yes, you'll have Kevin Owens and Cesaro, and they could spot fest their way through 10 or 12 minutes to fool me into thinking it's going to be better than it is. But basically, we've got a four-hour Survivor Series, multiple tag matches, and a triple threat IC title match, and just a whole lot of dumb shit going on. And that's what this show was. It was botches throughout. It was just a bunch of dumb shit going on, period. It's a great sign for Sunday.